Okay, we'll get started. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first in our uh, series of webinars uh, that will run through from now, June 26th today, until September the 4th, running every fortnight. Um, first up today in the, in the webinar is uh, getting things done, uh, an introduction to lean for pig farming. And we have two excellent speakers uh, with us today. We have uh, Professor Richard Keegan from the Trinity Business School in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, who's an international expert on lean, and we'll get a little bit more as we get to talk, hear from him uh, shortly. And we also have Michael McKeown um, from the Chagas Pig Development Department, who will go through a number of case studies uh, from the, the pilot project and the proof of concept project. Um, but I suppose just by way of background, lean and, and pig production, I suppose we all associate lean with the carcass. But uh, a few years back, Dr. Sean Brady, uh, chair of the Pig Industry Stakeholder Group for the Department of Agriculture, uh, invited me to participate as, uh, in the group and on one of the, the meetings uh, he invited Richard Keegan in uh, to talk about lean uh, lean principles um, so yeah look as you'll find out shortly Richard's is very very informative very enthusiastic person uh, in, in his work and, and what he has done in lean over the years and uh, I saw potential there at the time that you know this is something we could bring to the pig industry here in Ireland and uh, so what we did was we identified a farmer uh, that was interested myself and Michael uh, discussed it with them and I suppose the first issue we came up with was funding how are we going to fund this project um, and that's where our partners uh, the Borbia and Department of Agriculture came on board there had been a Borbia had run a, a lean mushroom project and um, so on the basis of that and the way that was funded we, we set up a funding mechanism with the Department of Ag and Borbia and we've so far completed a pilot project which went really well we've had a number of our own Chagas Pig Development Department uh, advisors trained in lean uh, and continuing to train in lean and subsequent to the pilot we, we ran a what we call a proof of concept so it was a bit more focused a bit more detailed uh, lean project uh, and it's all culminated in almost 60 farms to date now have completed lean projects of, of one description or another uh, through a panel of lean consultants uh, working throughout the country um, as I say, it's been very positive feedback, and I suppose it culminated this year. There's a network that we're involved in in Chagas, European network with 13 countries, uh, 19 different organisations, and they have a Grand Prix of best practices every year. And thankfully, we can we can uh, we've informed you already through newsletters and so on. But we had a winner this year uh, under the lean uh, lean practice um, uh, theme, uh, where we did a 5S lean project, and you see a bit more about that later on when Michael talks to you. Um, so yeah, it's going really well, and now we're seeing uh, a lot of interest from abroad, not just in Ireland, but also from abroad, from the UK, uh, across Europe, and even in the US, uh, we're getting inquiries about the lean work we've done to date. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll set up today's speaker. Our, as I mentioned, our first speaker is Professor Richard Keegan. Uh, he's an adjunct professor with Trinity College Business School in Dublin. Richard, in a previous life, was spent 30 years, I think you can correct me on that, Richard, but 30 years working with Enterprise Ireland. And uh, he's, he's Mr. Lean, uh, not just in Ireland, but internationally. He has uh, worked extensively in Japan with the EU Japan uh, Center. He works with Toyota and is, is supporting their Toyota Lean Management Center over in the UK. Uh, and he's worked with a number of other countries internationally, but also here in Ireland, he has, he has worked with Dairy Gold, Dambia and Arivo. Uh, and he's written extensively on Lean, all for charity, I might add. Uh, and he also apparently likes to ride motorbikes a lot. So if we have time at the end of it, he can tell you a bit about that as well. So I'll hand over to Richard now to uh, share his screen and go through his part of the presentation. Richard. Thank you very much, Kieran. Uh, I'll just share the screen here now. Um, after that introduction, there's only one way to go, and that's downwards, but you're, we'll, we'll do our best. As Kieran said, um, I worked for almost 30 years, 28 years in Enterprise Ireland for Bert Olas before that. And my focus has always been around what can we do to improve the performance of companies. So when I was in Enterprise Ireland, we were faced, as we always would be, with how can Ireland be as competitive as it needs to be to be able to sell internationally, because we're surrounded by water. So we have to be even more effective and efficient than people in Central Europe. So that led me over many years towards lean. And I was released into the game uh, when I went to Frank Ryan, the then chief executive, and Julie Cinnamon, uh, who took over from him. 
uh, to try out what I was thinking, which was, could we find what would work from the lean journey in Ireland? Not with multinationals, not with all the resources that are available to all the foreign companies, but for Irish companies with Irish resources. And that led me to try to simplify down the thinking, try to bring it down to what was the essence and the core of what lean was. And that's what I spent my working life trying to do. Um, when I finished in Enterprise Ireland and I retired in October uh, 2018, um, we had 1,153 projects supported with Enterprise Ireland clients and over nearly one and a half to nearly just under two billion of savings independently identified. So we had proven that lean would work in manufacturing in Ireland from the food companies. The food companies were one of the first ones to really engage with the lean thinking. Um, all the major dairies, all the major food processors. I'll never forget the day I went down to Ross and was with, uh, with Leiden and his senior team there and the guys. And we talked about what would happen in the plant and how they could apply lean in the plant. And I said to them, guys, don't you have farms as well? What if you applied the lean thinking into the farms where you're rearing the pigs? And that was the start of a long conversation. The thinking became adopted by the IDA for their smaller international companies and more recently for the local enterprise offices. So for micro companies across Ireland to try to bring the thinking into it. And as Kieran said there, I was asked in to meet the, the pig group in the department. So what does a Dublin fella have to contribute to farming? Very, very little, except maybe some thoughts on process. And what struck me immediately was that wearing pigs was all about process. So we got into a conversation, as Kieran said, to try it, would it work at all? Uh, the pilot to prove the concept and then into the first phase of rollout, which was stunted a little bit for this year's activity because of the COVID activity, which is why we're all here today. So, Richard Keegan, the mother's delighted. She can call me professor. I'm, I teach in the business school in Trinity College, Dublin. I'm also a visiting professor in the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, as I found out, one of the either first or second biggest pig rearing or hog rearing states in the US. I teach operations over there to an MBA class. This is a little bit of Japanese, and if I just share it with you, it comes from judo and the way that judo tries to share thoughts. And in judo, you're trying to get the maximum benefit for the least amount of effort. And in my thinking, that's what lean is about. How can we get the most benefit for our businesses, for us as the leaders, owners, managers, farmers, for the staff who are working in the farms, in the units? How can we get the most benefit for the least amount of effort. And that I thought was a good way of describing lean. In the definition of it, it's about leadership team. The leader, the boss, the owner, somebody deciding that they can and choose to build the capability and the capacity of their people to identify problems and fix them. But the problems can be large or small, and usually, a small problem can be ignored and glossed over because it's only a small problem. But every one of those problems burns up some energy, burns up some feed, burns up some lost value in the business. So lean is about looking for value and finding ways to do it. Why go lean? I mentioned the impacts at the national level for the manufacturing companies and the service companies. Literally, one just under two billion of quantified savings and six plus thousand people trained in the thinking of lean and many many other benefits but that was okay for manufacturing and service would it work in the pig sector and as i said it was delighted to engage with with michael and kieran and jared and the team in in chagask because we thought there was something that might work now i'm not going to go into the money value of the savings. Michael will talk a bit about that in the cases at the end of it because he knows what he can say, what he can't say. And that leads to a very important point. Each of the individual units information is strongly protected and guarded. So privacy is very important when you're deploying lean in a sector. But suffice to say, there have been some serious savings made and identified, serious amounts of money. I like to describe it, how many motorbikes could you buy for that? And you could buy quite a few really nice motorbikes, uh, quite a few Mercedes S-Class cars for the savings identified. But Michael will talk about that a bit later. 
with the challenges that we're now facing in terms of accessing people, at least before the COVID hit, um, one of the big savings and benefits of the lean implementations in the pilots was the saving of time and effort. People were having time that they didn't have to spend doing wasteful activity, and the work involved was reduced. Better quality pigs, and very importantly, feed conversion efficiency. Uh, over a cup of coffee sometime, I might tell you the story of when I did go into the department and we talked about the transfer of feed into the animals. So the programs, the pilots have looked at the systems, how things are done, the layouts of the farms, the units, the detail of parts of it in terms of the medicines or in terms of the, the sampling areas. Michael will touch on that. About the use of the feed, water, space use. All practical approaches and elements to help farmers get pigs successfully through units into the processors. I tried to simplify stuff down without making it simplistic, but try to get to the essence of things. Lean is about doing what you do, quicker, better, cheaper, together. Why quicker? Well, we know in today's world, if it's not done on time, there's a problem. Why better? Nobody will accept the quality that was acceptable 10 years ago or even five years ago. And cheaper, prices are going up. How can we spend less of our money so that we keep more of our margin? The together word, I think, is very interesting. Unless you're in the farm, in the unit, by yourself, with nobody else there, you have an opportunity to get the full benefit of the together. If you've got more than just you, how can you get the full benefit of their contributions to help you get your animals through your systems effectively and efficiently with the least amount of volume? Lean itself is focused on effectiveness and efficiency, of doing the right things and doing them well. We call it a war on waste, taking a really serious approach to say, okay, maybe now I hadn't realized we were wasting time or money or effort or food or space, but now that I see it, what are we going to do to tackle it? Taking a serious approach to the, to the questions. The alternative, we're not serious. We don't really care. It doesn't matter. Now, I think in the pig cycle, there's issues and challenges. Sometimes when the price is good, there's no need to look at the process. I would think there should be a real good look at the process when things are good. Similarly, when prices are bad. What can we do to remove our waste when prices are bad? But if we can keep looking at improving the process, whether the cycle is high or low, we get a chance to re achieve real efficiency and effectiveness in the production of pigs. Lean started in the automotive sector. Effectively, American and Welsh consultants realized that in Japan, uh, in Toyota, they were making a Lexus in the same length of time it took to fix their Mercedes S-Class. And they said, there's a problem here. And they went to look and see how could the Japanese make effectively a very similar car, but in a fraction of the time. And they called it Lean because when they went there, they saw very little waste, very little fat, as they saw it in the processes, compared to what they saw in Europe and America. So they developed some principles in looking at what the Japanese were doing and trying to understand it. And they looked at the tools of what's known as the Toyota production system. And they said there were five principles that the Japanese were following. They'd identified value. What was adding value for the customer? They mapped the value stream. Where was the value being added or taken away? captured or lost throughout their factories. They created flow. They wanted things to move naturally in a, in a gentle pace. They wanted pull. So when the customer wanted something, they would make it. And they were looking for perfection. They'd identified what perfection would look like for them, and they were hunting constantly to be better at what they were doing. And Womack and Jones looked at the basic tools of Lean. A number of years later, a guy called Jeffrey Liker wrote a book called The Toyota Way. And for the first time, he had realized that Toyota was not just about the tools. It was also about the big why, the hearts and minds of their people. So he brought together for the first time this understanding of the tools are one thing, but the big why is another thing. And he shared that. Now, his book, The Toyota Way, is about 250, 300 pages. The actual Toyota way is a very small booklet of about 15 pages. 
because Toyota have said we have to have everything simplified to the essence so they can share it with their people across the world. Now, as Kieran said, I write, and when I write, I, the money goes to cancer research. It's anyway, we've all been touched by cancer. So anytime I write, the proceeds go to cancer research. I gave one copy of a book I'd written a number of years ago called Applied Benchmarking for Competence to a guy called Roy Coleman. Now, Roy is a gentleman, a fantastic, gifted man in the whole lean space, trained directly by Toyota. And he turned Harley Davidson motorcycles from challenging motorcycles in terms of efficiencies and in terms of performance uh, and the processes they use to make them down to really streamlined, capable and efficient processes. Got on like a house on fire. I asked him would he read my ABC book. He read it. I called him back. What did you think, Roy? He said it was okay. I don't know if you speak American, but I speak enough American to realize that okay is not the same as phenomenal or brilliant or fab. So I asked him, what did I miss? He said, you missed principles, rules, and tools. I hadn't heard about these before in this context. I said, what do you mean by principles, rules, and tools? And he went silent. I asked him three times. He didn't answer my question. I put down the phone and I was not a happy bunny. And I let myself blow off a bit of steam for a while. Why would this really good guy, a, a fabulous guy, a lovely man, not answer a simple question? And I realized he had answered it, but he'd answered it in the real way of a teacher, of a sensei, as we call it. He had asked me to think, what did I mean by principles, rules, and tools if I was going to make them personal to me and share them with people in Ireland? He never mentioned questions, but I'll come to that in a moment. So the more I thought about lean, and the principles of lean in Ireland, and the fact that I was dealing with manufacturing service, food, software, chemicals, all different sectors, I didn't think that the car making principles were as relevant as I could share them in my understanding. So I came up with what I thought were the five principles of lean. Initially, I only had three, by the way, but my thought evolved. The first is time. Everybody can measure time. How long does it take? How long is an animal in farrowing in, in first phase and second phase? How long does it take to get the feed mixed? How long does it take to get the medicines? How long? Everybody can measure time. Money, are we making it or losing it? Are we putting feed into an animal for no benefit? Are we wasting money without even knowing about it? Are we putting the wrong nutrients into an animal at the early stage of their life that we then have to pay to get it taken away as poo? Can we look at our money across our facility, across the unit, across the full extent of the unit? Effort relates to the hardness of the work for our people to do it. How hard is it for our people to do the job that we've asked them to do? Do we realize we've asked people to walk backwards and forwards rather than having tools at each of the sheds, each of the unit elements? Can we look at the effort that the people have to do as opposed to what we think has to be done? That strikes a resonance with me when I heard years ago working for a number of different bosses, it's only a 10 minute job. It was all very well for the boss to say it's only a 10 minute job, but very few of the jobs were 10 minutes. But they understood the job as purely 10 minutes. They didn't understand the full effort to get the work done. I said, they were my first three principles. And I thought respect and challenge were understood, but I realized I should state them. Respect. Respect is a very important one. Respect for our people, our people respect for us. Respect for society, respect for the environment, respect for the customer, respect for the animal. But most importantly, a bit of self-respect. Do we have enough self-respect to say, actually, you know what? I'm good, but I can get better. Do you know what? I'm great, but I can actually be become phenomenal a bit of self-respect to want to actually get better. And that led me to challenge. Can we take on a challenge to say we're good, but there might be something else we can do that will help us push on to the next level of ability and capability? The rules, so principles, rules. The rules for me were twofold, some for people, some for process. And the first three came from a gentleman called Liam Lacey in Tanko Engineering. Many of you in the farming would know of the tanko balers and the tanko wrappers, or the tanko wrappers, and the, before that, the, uh, the 
lifts on the front of the tractors. Liam shared with me fairness, firmness, and consistency. And I thought these three words were very powerful. We need to be fair to our people, but our people need to be fair to us. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Firmness. If we know how something should be done or how we want something done on our unit in our farm, that's how it should be done. We call it standard operating procedures in the lean game. But firmness, if there is a way of doing it, that's what gets done because we know that's the best way that we know to get it done. And consistency. How we deal with our people needs to be consistent, not just because you're the favorite that you get special treatment or the best biscuit. So they were the rules for people. But I thought there was also rules for processes. So if you're trying to improve a process, the very first thing you must do is, is look at what is actually going on. Don't rely on the pictures in your head or your memory of it. Go out to the place. In the game, we call it going to the Gemba, but go out to the unit and look and see what's actually going on, not what you think is happening. And when you look, you need to be able to see. It seems very obvious, but sometimes we're so used to looking at something and so used to doing something, we don't see the little things that we've done to fix the bits that aren't quite right. So looking and seeing are important. Understand. Understand what's going right or going wrong. Understand the depth of the process. Understand. Take the effort to really try to get into what's happening and then think, what can I do to make it better? Is there something we can do to make it better? But if you just look, see, understand and think without doing, you've just wasted more time. So it's really important to do something and check and see if you've made a difference. Did what you thought would make a difference, make that positive change? Yes or no? If yes, good. What's the next thing? If no, why did it not work? As Kieran said, I get asked to, to visit the world. I, I teach this stuff all over in lots of different places. And I was asked to give a keynote at the, the European uh, Quality Association's annual conference. And I met the guy there who was the publishing editor for Duran Institute. Now, Duran was a well-known quality guru many years ago. And he wrote a handbook of the tools of quality. The book is bigger than the Bible. For years, I'm asking people, have they read it? Nobody's ever read it. Everybody dives in to get an equation, but nobody can read it. It's bigger than the Bible. So in the quality world and the lean world, there's so many thousands and thousands of different tools. But what are they based upon? And these are the five fundamental lean tools. You must know what's going on. And we call that process mapping. What is actually involved to get the job done? Capture down the actual steps, map out the process. And there's many sophisticated ways of doing it. There's very simple ways of doing it. Make a list of the different steps of the job. The physical flow mapping. What are the movements of the people, the animals, the materials through the unit? We call it the spaghetti diagram when we're doing it for the lean world because it's always crossing backwards and forwards. And once again, Michael will talk about a real example in Irish piggeries that would demonstrate this. A check sheet, some way of capturing what went wrong so you don't have to remember it. A run chart, can you see if it's getting better or getting worse? Can we show people that their efforts have made a difference to the running of the piggery, to the results being achieved? And the fifth key tool is the teams. How can we engage with our people, working collectively as a group, to make things better. I mentioned Roy hadn't asked me about the key questions. And I'll just share with this. I don't know if any of you watch the uh, cookery programs on the telly, the master chef type of things, or even hotel type programs. Quite often when they go into their kitchens, nearly every time they go into their kitchens, you'll find they have rational ovens, rational, R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L. This is a company in Southern Germany, they have about 50% of the global market for industrial cookers. I've engaged with them for nearly 14 years at this stage. But about year three, year four of the interaction, I spent two days on site with 30 of the managers going to every part of the business, right across the plant, big plants, every different department. And at the end of the two days, we're in a debrief session in a very small airless room. And they said, Dr. Keegan, we don't understand one thing. I said, 
I always like to speak the local language. What do you not understand? Yeah? And they said, oh, you speak the Deutsch. I said, yes, thank you, Sean. Right? And I was panicking. Because I couldn't remember what questions I had asked. And these 30 guys were waiting for my words of wisdom. And the more I thought about it, I realized I'd asked five questions. Can you please tell me what are you doing? Can you please tell me how you're doing it? And can you please tell me why you're doing it like that? But these were the questions of capturing the facts of what was going on. Most people can tell you what they're doing. Not everybody can tell you the how they're doing it. And by that, I mean, they might not be doing it the way the Jew is the boss, the owner, the farmer, the manager would want them to do. It. And not so many people can know why they're doing something. Is it to protect the biosecurity of the unit? Is it to improve the feed conversion? Is it, you know, why? Why are these things being done? And the last two questions are even less often answered. Who is going to improve it and when? How can we make a difference to make our process, our business better? In the lean space, we talk about wastes, the waste of transportation, moving things around, inventory, having too many medicines, some of them may be going out of date, the motion, trying to find things that we can't find because they're not in the right place, waiting, over-processing. In pig production, over-processing to me would be maybe overfeeding the animals so that it's outside of the range that the processors want. Overproduction, maybe having too many animals at the wrong time to go to the processor. And defects. Is an animal sick? Is there poor conformity? Is it damaged? Is it hurt? The eighth waste is not talked about by Toyota because it goes through everything they do. It's the waste of people's skills, the waste of the energy that people could bring if we ask them to help us to engage to make things better. What Lean to Me is about action, but action based on facts. And benchmarking, the capturing of real fact and real data, is a fantastic way to do a diagnosis, to kick the game into play. Have we got the facts of what is going on in our unit? Do we understand them well enough? Can we take the chance to look in the mirror and to actually see what the truth is? Now, this was made for me in Italy a couple of years ago. I'm obviously follically challenged. I'm bald as a coot. But I looked in the mirror getting ready for this talk today, and I says, God, Richard, the hair is looking good today. I am bald. The hair doesn't look good. And that led me to think that when you're in a business for many years, and before I worked for the state, I worked in the private sector, including Nestle. The big challenge was how to be able to see afresh the processes, the business, the activity that we're so used to. And benchmarking is a great way to give you objectivity to be able to see that. And the Chagas team have a great way to capture the facts and the data. I'm an engineer. I'm very interested, as, as Kieran said, I'm an enthusiast. I regard myself as an enthusiast. But I'm not an enthusiast blindly following that lean is a great thing. I was challenged about how could we do things that would make a difference to Ireland, because I care about Ireland. It might seem a bit silly, but I care about what I do, and I always have. So I wanted to find out why it didn't work. And sometimes people would say, ah, sure, I don't think it will work. And if you don't believe it's going to work, it won't. Or it's too simple or too sophisticated. Some people think they have to know all the answers. Other people are afraid to try something. But these reasons why it doesn't work are very easily balanced by, well, if we try it, what happens? If we do an experiment, if we say, well, let's not go too sophisticated. Let's find a balance that's right for us. And that was the approach we took in Enterprise Ireland, and it's the approach that Chagas have taken now in the pig sector. I use wax on, wax off. It comes from the Karate Kid. And it talks about understanding the basics. And the more you practice with something, the better you get. And some of the results from pig farmers in Ireland are phenomenal. The fact that the Irish project has won in terms of the EU pig is a classic example. We have our friends on from the United Kingdom, interested to hear what we're doing in Ireland. Uh, colleagues and friends in America, University of Northern Iowa, you know, were talking with me last summer. We were talking about what we were doing in the pig sector. And I know that the uh, people in the United States are interested in this, including uh, a, a consultancy company I'm involved with in America, are very interested to hear what we're doing in Ireland in the producers and the processors. 
to share it with some very major companies in the States. Just because we're Ireland and small doesn't mean we can't be creative and find ways to do things. When we were getting ready for this, Michael asked me, a can you give an example of where it works, Richard? And I was wondering, and I, I came up with this one, and it's, it's a real life case of a company called Trumpf in Germany, in Stuttgart, outside Stuttgart, a place called Ditzingen. I've been thrown out of their first factory because I told them what I saw. I have a problem, I tell people what I see, and not disrespectful, but I just tell them what I see. And it's akin to telling somebody that their baby has sticky out ears. It's a family trait, so I use that example. Two years later, I'm in the headquarters and the owner of the business is sitting in the front row. I was last of 70 to give my feedback. I gave feedback, but I didn't go into the detail. I said I'd be happy to share the detail if they wanted later in the day, at any time. I didn't expect to be asked, frankly. But that afternoon, I spent two hours with the owner and his key uh, global operations director. And he described it as two hours of being hit in the stomach. And what I was trying to share with them was the difference between the pigs and the chickens. I said, when I walk to your facilities, I see the chicken and the pig. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I'm trying to explain the breakfast. The chicken was interested, the pig was committed. I said, you've got all these measures and metrics that the leaders want and the managers want the people to follow. And then you've got the workers who aren't really caring are not focused on them. And I talked a bit more and I engaged with them over the next three years about the pigs and the chickens with the operations director. About four years later, I'm back in Trump. I'm at a private dinner, fabulous, fabulous dinner. I sit down and who sits down beside me? Only Cowmuller, her Cowmuller, the owner. And he says, Richard, lovely to see you again. Now, I was surprised he remembered me. This guy meets so many people. I said, lovely to meet you again, uh, Matthias. Lovely to meet you again. He said, since you came here, we've increased our productivity by 30%. Now, imagine a three to four billion turnover company increasing productivity by 30% by understanding there needs to be more pigs than chickens, more engaged and committed people rather than people who are half interested. We had a lovely dinner very nice dinner. And that was me trying to explain to Michael when he put me under pressure to say, does it work? The answer is yes. Lean is about maximum benefit for the least amount of effort. How can we find ways to work with our people, our systems, our processes, our animals, our genetics, our suppliers, our service people, to be able to get the maximum benefit out of our individual units? I'll pass over to Michael now to talk about the uh, the examples on the cases and thanks Richard just while you're, you're doing that if you can stop sharing your screen so Michael can share his screen for for the case studies part just like to thank you for that that, that presentation uh, very thorough and a great overview of, of, of lean and um, for the participants listening in there you I would encourage you to ask your questions now you can put them in at any stage there through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. So if you hover your mouse or your cursor over it, you'll find Q&A there and put in your questions. Uh, and we, we'll have those after after the presentation there coming up with Michael. Um, so you can put them in at any stage throughout the, the, the talk. So we'd appreciate it if you'd put in your few questions there now. Thank you. Okay, Michael, whenever you're good to go there. So thank Michael, much, Kieran. Michael needs no introduction. Uh, Pig Development Department, but uh, also, uh, I don't know what belt are you on now, Michael, and the lean? Green belt or somewhere up along the way. Black belt, go on, yeah. Black belt, anyway, go on, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Kieran, and thank you very much, Richard. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome. Um, so Richard has, has teed up nicely, I suppose, the fundamentals of lean, and now we're going to jump into the pig pen and show you some of the initiatives that have been done over the last two years of the lean program. Uh, obviously, the time here is limited on the webinar, so we're only going to show five simple uh, um outcomes that farms have found. There's a lot more involved in it. So if you're involved yourselves in the future, uh, it, it'll be much more in-depth maybe than some of these examples. But we'll start off, one of them is a workplace organization. And I suppose it was a problem when the consultants went there that the, the workplace uh, was disorganized. There was a lot of time wasted looking for tools and equipment. And also, they used to take mineral samples on, on, on a weekly and a monthly basis. And the way they managed the mineral samples was ad hoc that you would, uh, uh, you're firing the mineral sample into a bin, how long it had been there, how many months it had been there, and stuff like that. So they wanted to get it much more simple system than that. Um, 
So what they did was they introduced what they call a 5S lean plan. And again, Richard mentioned uh, the Toyota way, and this is all coming from the Toyota way. And the 5S means you want to sort, set an order, shine, standardize, and sustain then the improvements you've made. And really, it's applying standard housekeeping practices to the workplace to really give the workplace a high level of organization. Because if the workplace is disorganized, it's very, very hard to be very, very efficient. So a tidy workplace is a tidy mind. That's another way of looking at it. So what did they do on this unit? They introduced the 5S for maintenance, for the mineral section, for the, uh, uh, for the medicine storage section, and for the wiener area and the feed areas. Mapped out the areas to train the staff, and they developed the plan and they implemented the plan. And most important of all then, as I said, sustaining these things is the biggest issue because with the best will in the world, we all have the thing nicely done. And after a couple of weeks, it slips and slips and slips. And before you know it, you're back to square one. So monitoring the improvements with checklists and with audits on a weekly and monthly basis is, is extremely important to try and hold the improvements you've made. An example of this then was that they, uh, they tidied up the store area. Every, every, everything had a place. As, as I mentioned here, you can see the store area there that in instead of bags, everything's all in this place. The, uh, the, the medicine store is the same thing over here and all the tools in, uh, um, in, in, in the lower one. And they also did a, a checklist on a weekly, a monthly and an annual basis to make sure that the thing isn't going to slip anymore. Sounds very simple, but it is important. Another example here, for example, is the, is the maintenance store, and all units have this. You have the, uh, the tool shed, the maintenance store, and literally somebody takes something and they throw it back on the shelf, and then somebody else is looking for something, and you have to have a route around on, on the shelf, and you're not sure is it there or is it missing. After 10 minutes of a lot of bad language, you find that someone else has taken a hammer and it's not there at all. So what they did was very simple. Everything has a place, everything is labeled, and the three big advantages of, of a system like this is one, if you're going into something, if you're going into the work shed, you can find the thing very, very quickly. You also will notice that if there is something missing out of one of the slots, then you need to find out who has, has taken it last and it needs to be returned. And by telling people to do this after a period of time, they, they eventually get into the routine of returning the things that they have borrowed out of the shed. The other thing you can do as well is that if you're running short on nuts or bolts or fuses or something like that, where you have the space there where it's showing, you simply then uh, just put a, a red label over it. So when the person is ordering the stuff there, anywhere uh, with a red label shows that uh, the item there is running low and they need to order more. So again, it's not rocket science, very simple, but it does save a lot of time and more important, a lot of frustration from doing it. The other area that was mentioned there uh, was on the mineral sampling. And again, this is a very, very simple idea, but it's, 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 it's very efficient. So instead of just taking a sample and just throwing it into a bin, and then you have samples and the old samples are at the very bottom of the bin and the new samples are at the top of the bin or stuff like that. And this can be done for minerals or for feed or whatever else. You, you do boxes with each of the months there all, all labeled on it. So for example here, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, okay? You enter the stuff there in the, in the last box, and then after six months then, or seven months then, the oldest box, the contents are discarded, box moves around, relabeled here, and this is your new box. And all the boxes then are all moved all towards the door. So the oldest box is always nearest the door out. So if you get an audit or get something like Red Tractor or Board B or something like that, and they're asking for a, as a sample from last May or June or so, you can put your hand on the sample extremely fast. Again, very simple system, very... <laughs> idiot proof as long as, uh, as you keep up the standards. The other thing they use was what they call a Kanban system. Again, this is from Toyota and it's all it is is a visual system of flags. And if you're doing the, um, when you're doing the audit there, they had a rating from one to six, it was red, seven to eight was amber and nine to 10 was green. So if, if, if you got a rating of one to six, substantial action needed to be made and if it was nine to 10, then everything was acceptable. The outcome overall for this particular unit was that the estimate that there was 30 minutes per day per, uh, per person in the unit was saved. It's a modest saving, but it was only the very first start, as they say themselves, because they're now looking at other waste and other poor processes that they want to try and improve. And they reckon that with the stuff that's on, online at the moment, uh, they will get savings of anything from 10 to 20,000 a year. So substantial savings for something that isn't going to cost a lot of investment. 
A second one there, and this is really getting into the pig pen, is looking at the accommodation plan. As we all know, for units over the last number of years, the sow output has increased. We've more born alive, we've more weaners, we've more finishers on the unit. As a result of that, some of the units that were built as a 500 sow unit selling maybe 24 pigs per sow per year is now a 500 sow unit selling uh, 28 or 29 pigs per sow per year. So we really need to stop and map all of the accommodation. And one thing on units is that we usually judge the pen by the floor area. But something that's even more important than the floor area per pig is the feeder access per pig because the, uh, the pig can have floor area but if it doesn't have enough access to the feeder it's never going to grow so one of the things that we we wanted uh, to do in this one is look at all of the pens and the houses based on floor area and feeder area for each pen and each room in each house so we ended up like this something like this this is the first stage house there you can see the number of pens uh, at, at various different sizes the maximum pigs that you're able to have would be 30 pigs the case here when they counted all the pigs is 352 this is the pen size it's the amount of feeder so it's half a feeder here so obviously the feeder has been shared between two pens uh number of pigs per feeder number of space per pig and the maximum uh, a number of pigs that you could have here was 360 to have 352 so there's minus eight pigs under the maximum again the, uh, the same here minus 62 so overall there's minus 70. Now in some of the pens uh, there could be as uh, at the maximum or slightly above they're all depending but you do this for every single house on the whole unit and then you have a master plan of the whole unit and this master plan then is stuck up in the office and at least you know then always how much space and how many pigs you're able to put in each pen. What they found on this particular unit was that actually from a space point of view they were fine so this is their, their master list of all the sections, first stage, second stage, the whole lot, the, each of the house names uh, for this particular unit that they know which house was which, number of rooms, number of pens, and then the pigs per space, okay? But what they found was in a lot of cases, right, the pigs per pen was fine and they're all green here, so there's no issue there. But what they found is when they did it on the pigs per feeder space, they found a number of the houses there were short in feeder space. So that's something there, if you're not gonna put the feed in, you're not gonna get the growth rate out. So it's something that really highlighted to them, if, if they are gonna fill these pens, they, and they can't put 20 in, the maximum they can put is 17 in, or else they have to change the feeding system. So they have the options on either one. That brings me on to another trial here, looking at the feeding system. On this particular unit, what they found was when they weaned the pigs every week, uh, irrespective of whether the pigs were big or small, when they went into certain, pen, uh, certain pens, they couldn't get the growth rates out of those pens. And this has been going on for a long number of time, a long period of time, even when they split the pigs 50-50 on the same feed, the whole lot, they couldn't get it. So they began to think it was something to do with the feeder design on the unit. So they did trials then, and they weighed all the pigs on into each of the pens, uh, the average weight at weaning, uh, the average weight as they came off. They looked at the average daily gain for each of these. And for some of the pens there, they had what you call swing feeders. So you have the hopper, and then at the bottom of the hopper, you have a ball, and, and, and the pigs hit the ball, and the feed comes out. And other ones then, it was simple four-foot back-to-back feeders. So they measured all the pigs in, all the pigs out, and they got the growth rates. And what they came up at the end for this particular unit was that the swing feeders there had a total weight gain on all the pens of 1541, whereas the four foot back to back feeders had, had 1836 of a weight gain. So obviously in the unit here, it might be the same for all units, but in, in this unit, the four foot back to back feeders were giving them more space and the pigs were doing better. What they did, uh, the outcome of this was that they put in extra four foot feeders into the swing feeders and uh, the growth rates have been shown to have improved as a result. So this again, very simple trial, but it's something that had been ongoing on the unit for a long period of time and really hadn't been, hadn't been nailed. And so when they did the, uh, the lean program, that was one of the things they really wanted to nail on it. Another issue here in a separate unit was that they had a problem with the wet-dry feeders. So as we know, it's best practice uh, from a welfare point of view that when uh, before finishers go to the factory, that they're given a break from feed uh, before they get in the truck uh, uh, for the processor plant. But what this unit found was that the feeders started rooting at the wet-dry feeder, uh, sorry, the finishers started rooting at the wet-dry feeders and were causing a lot of breakages uh, with the wet-dry feeders on the slides, on the adjustments, they're sticking their heads in and they're banging their feeders and that was causing a problem. And it was, it was causing a lot of repairs and a lot of time was involved in it. So what this one did was that they looked at the cost involved in making a feeder guard. 
so that w once you're giving the feeders and uh, the finishers a break from the feed, you could put down the feeder guard there and it stopped the pigs sticking their heads in and banging around the feeder. And so as a result of this, what they did was that they made up five feeder guards and they got a local company to make them up and they simply slotted across the wet-dry feeders uh, uh, once the pigs were, were being given a break and that stopped the damage. Again, very, very simple thing. But again, if, if, if you have five or 600 sow units or 1,000 sow units and even an awful lot of wet-dry feeders and it was a lot less repairs needed to be done over the time. Last but not least is probably a hobby horse of mine is looking at slaughter weights. And as Richard mentioned, if you're over processing something, effectively you're producing something that somebody doesn't want. Uh, so in the case here, it was supplying an out of spec product. So the pigs you were supplying to the processor were underweight or overweight pigs. So it was something that this unit wanted to look at. Now, when we looked at it there, the small, the volume of pigs being sold that were underweight or overweight was very, very small, 1.7% of the pigs. So you could argue that 98.3% of the pigs being supplied were on the spot in spec. Would you get worried about the 1.3, 1.7%? Well, my opinion, it's a bit like poker. There's money on the table there and you have left a, a 7,000 euros on the table there. You've walked away from the table because these are animals that don't have any issues if, uh, from a physical point of view. They're not being condemned. They're simply either, either too light or, or, or they're too heavy. So there's a lot of money there, which you could argue should be pure profit that you're leaving behind on the table. So we looked at it. One of the things the unit wanted to look at was if they did a selection three weeks before sale, how would that affect the number of pigs out of spec? So what we did was we looked at the factory data and the factory data unfortunately comes in PDF format. So it took a lot of time in, 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 uh, to input all the factory data with six months of data to in, in, input, which was 9,373 pigs, which it inputted. And at the same time then we looked at the data after then we had the three week uh, 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 top selection done. So we did the top selection for six months and then we looked at the data. What's the data show? Here's a curve here, which shows all of the 9,000 pigs in, in the curve and where they all are. So we had the mean average weight was 91.9 uh, kilos dead weight. So uh, they were selling a heavy pig. And the minimum there, the lowest pig was 48 kilos, which is some, uh, some different from 91. And the maximum then was 130 kilos. So there was actually, what, 90, uh, nearly 90 kilos of difference between the minimum and max. So that's fine. But how did that relate to what the, the processor wanted? So you can see the lower weight here was 90, 65 kilos and the upper weight here was 120 kilos. When we looked at it there, we found now by selecting the tops, 0.48, so half a percent of the pigs were now below the line here and nearly the same amount were above the line here. So it was a total there of 0.86% of the pigs were now out of spec, which is a big improvement. So 50% annual saving, and that would equate to about 3,200 euros. So by simply taking the tops three weeks before slaughter, uh, you're taking the 10% of the pigs out. So it could be the two or three heaviest pigs in the pen. That was saving you about 3,200. So this was 50% of the saving, but we still had 0.86% of the pigs outside sale weight. So this particular unit here, are now going after the other 50%, which is probably is going to take me a little bit longer because if you look at and the biggest contributor to sale weight variation is the birth weight, which is 20%, and the weaning weight, which is about 25%. So you're really going back here to seeing how do you get your birth weights up and your weaning weights up again. So you're looking at the birth, weights, uh, the, uh, the birth weight of the piglets. You're looking at the suckling ability of the sows, cross-fostering, uh, feeding milk, stuff like that. But this is what this unit now is working on, and they're determined to reduce the standard deviation and, and the variance of the pigs at the end of it. That's all I have now for you. So I will hand you back now to Kiran um, and he will just wrap up there the last few slides we have. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks very much for that good overview there of a few simple uh, case studies that have worked well through the, through the pilot and the, the, the second project. Um, just remind you again there to put your questions through the question and answers uh, uh, session uh, we'll have shortly. Um, but just first of all, before we, we, we get to the questions and answers, uh, I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, our partners. I've mentioned them already, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, Food and the Marine, um, Damien Ward in particular there, and on the Board BS side, uh, Peter Duggan. Um, we've worked well as a, as a team, uh, along with Richard then, uh, giving us external support uh, so far. And 
as, as I said, we were hoping to run a, a, a third project this year, but COVID has gotten in the way. But uh, look, all going well uh, and COVID pending, uh, we'd like to, to kickstart later on in the year. Um, and more about that and on. I'd also like to thank the, the lean consultants that have been involved in the project and have proved themselves very useful uh, throughout the, the, the pilot and second project. Uh, so I'd like to thank both of those. Uh, so Michael, next slide then. Um, the further activities, this as I say is the first of in our webinar series and you can just see here a brief slide uh, on the remaining uh, five um, webinars to come up between now and September. We have one on biosecurity uh, in July and then at the end of July we have another one on nutrition, the wiener pig nutrition uh, with Pater Lawler. Uh, we have Miriam Lechner from Germany then uh, talking about rearing pigs with intact tails and on-farm experience over there in Germany. Jens Sorensen from Denmark uh, to look at the whole area and very topical area of antibiotic re re reduction, use and reduction. And Charlotte Luridsen also from Denmark uh, is an expert in the supplemental milk uh, to, to pigs in the farming room and, and post weaning. So that's what we've got to look forward to over the remaining five uh, webinars as we go on. And on the next slide, Michael, then just to inform you a little bit more um, as well as what we've done today and the, the, the project that we're hoping to run later in the year, uh, we're producing two booklets, one on introduction to lean for pig farms. So there'll be a bit more detail on, on what Richard went through today. Uh, so a high-end kind of a book for anybody who's interested in getting into lean and lean for pig farms uh, to see what you can learn there and the different techniques and methods and tools, uh, the principles, rules and tools as, as Richard described and the questions. Uh, and also then uh, following on from Michael's work, we're going to put together a, a book purely on case studies uh, from the first two uh, lean projects that we've been involved in. Um, so we'll have a, a, a small booklet there that will give some more examples uh, of what has worked and worked well on farms. Uh, with a view to the, the next uh, uh, lean project taken off, maybe later this year, we're hoping to run uh, with Richard uh, and the Trinity College Dublin Business School, a training session, a three-day training session for managers and owners and lean leaders from pig farms um, to, to, to train them up on, on lean and what it's about and how they can apply that onto their farm. And then hopefully towards the end of the year, if, if uh, COVID has, has passed to a degree where it's safe enough to, to get back out on farms in more detail. Uh, we'll run a number of Lean Start and Lean Plus programs uh, running through from late this year into maybe 2021. So the call to action now is for yourselves uh, as farmers to, to get in contact with the Pig Development Department uh, to see how you can get involved. If you've already been involved and want to get involved again, uh, we'd like to hear from you. And um, if you haven't been involved and are interested in thinking about it, well, contact us and we, we'll set you on the road. So. Um, yeah, uh, we've a, a number of questions there. Um, so I'll hand over Amy. Quinn has been working away with us here. To be fair, Amy, work, Amy's always working here, but she's she's done a lot of a lot of good work in the background setting up these webinars as well as our other digital information of of late. Uh, one of the other key things I might just mention at this stage is our podcast, The Pig Edge. Uh, there's six of them already recorded, and you'll find them on our website or Spotify or iTunes. A uh, new initiative that Amy has driven, and she's also uh, been to the fore in getting this webinar up and running. So, Amy, if you have a few questions there that you want to, to throw at the Yeah, um, I suppose we're wary of the time is another thing to say, so we do want to keep it to the hour just because we're aiming for it to be a, a lunchtime webinar. Um, so, people are a little shy with the questions, so if you have another question, do send them through. So, there is one question. Um, Michael, if you want to answer it, so were the case studies provided based in Ireland? Yep, they're all based in Ireland. So it's on the Lean program for the last two years. We've had about 60 units have been involved. Um, so we have a lot of case studies involved, uh, have, have, have shown up at this stage um, on all sorts of things from managers, from labor, from uh, feed efficiency. Um, generally, as Richard said, it's all coming back to waste and different ways of waste. So whether it's people walking, uh, where they don't need to. Um, it's um, as as Ford used to say, every step is a second, which is wasted. So it's it's looking at that movement around units. It's looking at feed conversion. It's looking at wastage of feed, and it's looking at the processing even of pigs of overweight or or where you're supplying pigs that are too fat. So we have a lot of case studies now over the last two years, and we hope to build on that in in the coming year. Now, if if we can get the next uh, the next round of the program opened at the end of the year. Okay, um, and I just have some questions myself, I suppose. Um, so these kind of projects have been running for the past number of years. Um, and the workplace organization case study was very interesting. Do you find that this was a common area on farms where lean could have a big impact? 
Yep, yep. It certainly is one of the areas because in fairness, like the pig units are a busy place um, and there's a lot of people working there. So you can have anything from maybe four or five up to 19 or 20 people. They're all doing their own jobs. So they're all coming to try and do it as fast as they can. Uh, they're coming in to get supplies in, 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 for example, to the workshops. They're getting the stuff. They're coming back. They're leaving it back because they're rushing off to do something else. So it's 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 just trying to organize the thing a little bit, a little bit better. And even, even from a situation of where instead of having um, one tool shop in the unit where the guys are, have to walk from one end of the unit to the other end of the unit, having the tools, having the tool shed in the center of the unit, like it's not rocket science, but it just, as again, as Richard's saying, it's just sitting back sometimes and looking, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And most important, is it adding value? If something isn't adding value, why are we doing it? So some, some people may argue even moving pigs from first stage to second stage, why are we doing that and is it value adding value to it so there's a lot of areas there the staff in fairness and most of the units have been uh, have have had a real interest in it and it's in their interest as well because it's making them more efficient so so why wouldn't they okay thanks Michael just, um, just, just uh, on that Amy just, yeah. just to, to add a couple of points um, the cases are from Ireland they're from Irish guys Irish farms Irish situations when I first brought the idea of bringing Lean into Enterprise Ireland, you can imagine that didn't go down well. Because everybody thought Lean was for the Japanese, it was only for the Germans, it only works in America. And it's always going to cut jobs, it's always going to be a cut, cut, cut. But what we brought in and what we've been evolving with the Chagas Lean Pig approach was how can we focus on the value of people's time without micromanaging? Because you don't want to get into the thing of, what did you do this minute? What you... It's about engaging with the people in the units to look afresh at what they're doing, but to look at it through the experience of other business. And that's what really interested me in engaging with the Chagas team in the pig knowledge transfer department. Because the more I learned about processing and creating pigs, the more I realized it was a process, a detailed process. So you had the potential to be able to look at the process and to work with everybody on the farm who might be, what would I call, educated to a third degree level, right? But to work with them because they're gifted with the ability to think. Many of our people run so many different things and do so many good things. So by engaging with them to look at what the day involves, what the week and the month and the months involved in wearing the animals, it gives a chance to identify what I call the pebbles in the shoe. And if you're trying to walk with a pebble in your shoe, it's very hard. If you take a pebble out of your shoe, you can usually walk an awful lot more easily. So it's about bringing this thinking that has been done in other sectors, now being proven in the proof of concept and the pilot, and bringing it more and more to real people in real farms and real units with real issues and challenges, as opposed to looking for a magic wand to fix the world. Very good. Thanks, Richard. Um, Another question there, Amy, just coming uh, for Richard. How do you avoid uh, micromanaging when reviewing processes with staff? I used to love being micromanaged. <laughs> Most people don't like being micromanaged, but it's a choice. The manager decides to micromanage or the manager decides to respect the people, to be real people, to be a part of the business going forward. So in my way of not micromanaging people, it was to say, guys, we're involved with this activity in our business, in our farm, in our units. We're working with Chagas. We're working with external consultants. I'm not going to micromanage. But I want you as my team member, as my employee, as my staff member, my family, whatever it is, I would like you to engage with the process to see if there's things that we've been doing that we couldn't see or things that we haven't been aware of. So it's up to the leader to decide, do I choose to micromanage? And it's a choice. God, I've worked for some great micromanagers over the years, but my experience was they didn't get the best out of me. But it's a choice. But if somebody is a micromanager, nothing is going to change them. Perfect. And just one final question, I suppose, Richard, before we wrap up. Um, Richard, Michael, might, you might both like my, like my to address it, like want to address this one. Um, have you assessed um, the impact of lean and staff recruitment and retention? 
Well, I, yeah. I follow on from what I was just saying about the micromanaging. Yeah. And um, most people don't leave a job; they leave the, leave their boss. And what I've found over the years at all levels, and I'm talking about some of the biggest and some of the smallest companies in the country, when people are given a chance to be a part of making it better, it makes it a better day. When people are dealt with with respect, it makes it a better day. And if people are being respected and getting paid reasonably well, chances are they're not looking for anything else. Yep, if I could just follow on, there was actually a very good paper there at the Lehman Conference there in, uh, in 2019, and they looked at the reason that staff, uh, high-performing uh, units, and the reason the staff, uh, uh, the metrics are looking at, at staff, and how can you tell a high-performing unit and a low-performing unit, and one of the biggest metrics of the low-performing units was the big turnover in staff, that they couldn't, the staff didn't want to stay on that unit, there was a big turnover of staff, and I know I deal with uh, a, a, a particular pig farmer and at certain times it may be down to labor, but at certain times then you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, is it something I'm doing? And maybe that's where you need to bring in someone from outside as an independent view and said, look, how can I improve this? Because if you can't keep staff on your unit, you're not going to make sustainable improvements year on year. Churning of staff is very, very difficult for a high performing unit. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, look, we're just going to wrap up, Jeff, but before I do, I'd just like to have a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, to our two speakers, uh, Professor Richard Keegan from Trinity Business School. Really appreciate your time and look forward to your support as, as we continue with the Lean Project. Uh, to Michael for covering the case studies and answering the questions. Thanks very much for that, Michael. Uh, I'd like to thank Amy, uh, as ever, for you know driving the, the, the background to getting the webinars registered, getting the whole thing set up with PR. Uh, and getting the thing running well today. Uh, and to Alison Maloney in PR, uh, who helped Amy uh, with the marketing and promotion uh, of that. And also to Mark Gibson in the Connect Ed department uh, for his support in the training over the last couple of days and hosting these webinars. Look, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, our, it's our first webinar of, of the series, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all back in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much. <laughs>